Hi, this is Mark, and welcome to our show on this episode. Brushes with classic fame. Everyone from Johnny Carson to Regis Philbin floated through the life of our guest today. And the results were not always positive. Comedian, actor Bruce Smirnoff joins us. His stories of crossing paths with the high profile in the entertainment industry, so popular that he actually did a one-man show about it. More on that a little bit later in the show. We begin with the Fast 15 politics and more with Michael Shore. We'll review what's happened this past week in the Trump presidency and beyond. Want to quickly mention we are watching with great interest and our heart breaks for everyone in the Texas area experiencing so much hardship and an unrelenting natural disaster. You know, most of the energy from a hurricane is associated with the hurricane falling apart. So while a lot of the ramp up to a hurricane is all about wind velocity and direction, it's really when a hurricane makes landfall and it falls apart, it may not even have any tropical characteristics about it any longer, that the most energy, the most rain, and in many ways, the great danger continues. And that's what's happened in the soaking that's unprecedented that's been going on and continues to go on in Texas. We'll touch on that a bit with Michael Shore, but our conversation with Michael Shore occurred before even this huge Hurricane Harvey had really done its damage to Texas. Finally, I want to thank you as I do weekly for all the support. Thank you for subscribing to the show on iTunes, on Stitcher, on iHeartRadio, wherever you listen. Thank you for your subscriptions. Those subscriptions help build our audience. Thank you for sharing the show. Thank you for the five-star reviews and the positive reviews that you've given us in the iTunes universe. All of that just helps keep our show alive. And thank you for supporting us financially with whatever little bit you spend on on Amazon. We get a little piece of whatever you spend on Amazon if you click on the Amazon link from our home page, edge-show.com. So if you go into an episode, if you're listening to an episode on your phone, you click onto that episode from our home page, edge-show.com. And there's an Amazon banner that'll say shop Amazon or something like that. If you click on that, and that'll take you through to the same Amazon you'd normally be on, but now it registers the fact that you reached Amazon through our site, so we get a small piece of whatever you spend. That's a way to help us keep the lights on here. All right. Thank you in all those different ways. And now let's get it going. It's time for the Fast 15. Michael Shore joining us by phone. Hi, Michael. Hi. Hi. You know, I, uh, I enjoy innovation. This is great, though. This is great. <laughs> Well, we appreciate your presence. Sort of a big week with all kinds of things going on. We'll pick a, a couple. In an administration that is famous for serving up controversy like a short order chef, the president pardons this Sheriff Joe Arpaio. He's the brutal sheriff who has been really in the crosshairs of controversy for years now because of his treatment of Latinos in Arizona. And yeah, listen, I mean, he's, um, he's also a convicted criminal and someone who was convicted of violating the constitutional rights of people. So that says all you need to know about Joe Arpaio. He's 85 years old. He is the picture of what this president, you know, when he campaigned, was painting as law and order. And I don't think that Joe Arpaio's idea of law and order is shared by, by most Americans and certainly wasn't shared by the court. So his pardon, the first pardon for this president is, uh, it, it's A, comes at, a, at an odd time. You know, you mentioned it, Mark, like there's this, this hurricane that, that was coming for Texas and the Gulf Coast. The president holed up at Camp David on a Friday afternoon. And rather than focus on the hurricane, waiting it out, seeing what was there and, you know, deploying whatever aid was needed in Texas on a federal level. He went to Camp David, did three things. He he issued an order that James Mattis, now the Secretary of Defense, has uh, jurisdiction over President Trump's feeling that transgender people should not be admitted into the armed forces. That's one thing. Then he did this Joe Arpaio. And then he said, as he was leaving for Camp David, when asked what the people in Texas or what he says to the people in Texas, he said, good luck. Yeah, when you run it down like that, here's this catastrophe in the making with this hurricane about to hit the coast, and you feel as though generally a commander-in-chief would say more than just good luck. You know, and it's not the end of the world. It was off the cuff. He was walking to his helicopter. But by the same token, uh, a president in the Times of national disasters and catastrophes is supposed to be the person that you, the country turns to, at least uh, is symbolically, to hear say, hey, listen, what, here's what we're doing. I don't have everything 
in front of me right now, but we've got FEMA on alert. We've got local officials down there. We learned from Katrina some of these things we need to do. Now we got to wait out the storm and just uh, pray that everybody's going to be all right. Get on your helicopter. This was just, you know, it just seemed, I don't know, it seemed typical. There are many other things about which to scrutinize this president. That wasn't number one. But when he gets on his helicopter, gets to Camp David and does those things, and then also Sebastian Gorka resigning from the White House, a White House advisor who drew a lot of criticism, probably this was a John Kelly decision that it was time for him to go. That's three pieces of news that, that sort of overshadow this storm with, with so many Americans in fear for their homes and in some cases their lives. Yeah, well, let me follow up just on a couple of things. First of all, as Michael says, it probably would have been so easy just to say a few things along the lines of, you know, our hearts are with the people in Texas, and they can be confident that if we need to do anything to help in the aftermath of the storm, we will, or whatever he might say. I want to go back to Arpaio for a second, because he sort of signaled when he was doing that big rally in Phoenix that uh, he was likely going to pardon Arpaio, who, despite the fact that he had a policy of profiling Latino drivers and Latinos generally and rounding them up in what he referred to as concentration camps, right? These places that were pretty awful. I mean, they're tent cities of prisoners where the temperature reached 145 degrees in a couple of places where there were closed circuit cameras trained on toilets that were in the ladies area. I mean, it was sort of a, really abusive in the extreme. And he defied a court order to continue that profiling. Isn't that in a nutshell who this Joel Arpaio was? And then isn't it true as well that he remained popular in that part of the world? Well, he, yes to your first question. That is Joe Arpaio. I mean, he was somebody who was, uh, you know, as openly racist in the way he conducted that department there as anyone in America. And uh, at times he wouldn't even shy away from it without calling it racism, but he did. You know, it was profiling. These are the people that are doing these things. These are the reasons and ways we're going to go about, uh, you know, uh, tracking them. Uh, I, I don't know about his popularity. He did just lose an election there. Of course, it came under an indictment, you know, when he was under indictment. But he was reelected numerous times to, to become sheriff there. And there are a lot of people that bought into his harsh law and order uh, outlook. And, and, you know, I, Arizona, a border state, a state where building a wall was so popular, they built one between Arizona and Mexico. Um, I, I think that, yeah, there, there's a, a different take on things. And I, I don't know that it's just unique to Arizona, but there's a different take on the way these the law and order happens in that part of the world because of Joe Arpaio. But here's the other thing. I mean, his the fact that Trump pardoned him, uh, where he doesn't fit the blueprint of what the Justice Department says is pardonable. Now, that doesn't matter at the end of the day. If the president wants to pardon Charles Manson, he can pardon Charles Manson. Uh, but the, there is a blueprint that Joe Arpaio didn't fit. His sentence wasn't going to be more than five years. Uh, his indictment didn't come within X amount of time. And and that was what was so surprising is the president kind of went beyond that. Also, the timing, a lot of these kind of sort of, I guess, if you're going to pardon somebody who is good to you, uh, who, who is old, who has outlived his, you know, the sentence would outlive them if they've done well. Uh, in, in serving it, um, that usually comes at Christmas time and at the end of a term. This kind of public pardoning of Joe Arpaio, someone who is so divisive, um, that's curious. Now, uh, if I can just quickly say that there's politics involved here. Donald Trump never forgets anything, and Joe Arpaio was a supporter of his, and Joe Arpaio will be a great surrogate, even at 85, for the candidate of Donald Trump's choosing in the race to oust Jeff Flake, a Republican senator who's being primaried by Kelly Ward. If Joe Arpaio can gather enough Trump-type voters to vote for Ward against Flake, that's that's what could be at play here in the most blatant of ways, but I think the most underreported of ways. Yeah, the Jeff Flake thing is interesting because it really just has emerged as an issue. What happened with Jeff Flake? He came out against the president and all of a sudden it was on. Yeah, he wrote a book called Conscience of a Conservative, and he had some pointed things to say about where politics is today and how this president isn't conservative and, you know, without naming names, really. I mean, he, he was, it was just alluding. 
Jeff Flake uh, had some problems with some of the things that Donald Trump wanted. Uh, he voted with him on health care. He's 93 percent with him as a voter, even though there haven't been a ton of votes. He's a conservative Republican. Uh, he has some problems with the Donald Trump with the wall and immigration. But Donald Trump has picked on him because Jeff Flake has criticized him and, and his demeanor, the way he conducts himself publicly, how bellicose he is in his rhetoric. And that's what happened. He's done it with John McCain, with Jeff Flake. He's done it with Bob Corker of Tennessee. And Flake is up. And Donald Trump wants to support. He wanted two other different challengers to Jeff Flake. But Kelly Ward, Dr. Kelly Ward, who lost to John McCain in a primary uh, 2016, is going to primary Jeff Flake now. Uh, it's so funny to um, see these people who appear regularly as talking heads who are apologists and explainers for the president. And I would suggest loyal to the president up to this point. And it's tough. I mean, let's face it, this presidency tests people's loyalty because you got to get out there into the cameras and to different media venues and do a lot of explaining. It's weird to see him turn on those people who have been so very loyal to him. I understand that some have stepped out recently, but boy, if you're not in lockstep, he really dials you in for trouble. Yeah, that's right. And But I mean, it's not just loyal. It's uh, Some of them have just gone along. They haven't really been vocally supportive and, and Flake fits that mold. Flake Blake and Ben Sass were among other senators who, you know, said of Trump that this is not who we should have. This was during the primaries, this kind of rhetoric. And Donald Trump doesn't forget. He's a little like a mafia don in a way. As soon as you wrong him, he's going to come after you. Yeah. And I think you accurately point to Flake as a real conservative. So if you're a real conservative, then this guy is just masquerading as a conservative. Right. Right. And it makes strange bedfellows because people who like what Jeff Flake is saying to Donald Trump are liberals who could not be further from the, the way that Jeff Flake thinks and operates. They, they wouldn't be able to stand this guy if they really looked deep into his record as a congressman and as a senator. The other thing I want to ask you, kind of a big story that just hatched, is this idea that John Kasich, the governor of Ohio, is going to get a ticket together where he would be president, and the governor of Colorado, the Democrat, John Hickenlooper, would be on the ticket with him. Yeah, I, that, I mean, that it would be kind of a unity ticket. It's just been floated. Its sources say it's, it's neither Kasich nor Hickenlooper saying it, but the idea that it's being floated, and let's say this is not the first time that these sorts of things have come up, that they've had the idea of having a unity ticket. Sam Nunn, the conservative Georgia Democrat in the 80s and 90s, and he um, was always floated as a possible Republican running mate for Republican presidential candidates, just to, to be in a unity sort of sense. It makes some sense, but, you know, if you're a progressive, you got to be really leery of this, because, first of all, Kasich would be the president and Hickenlooper the vice president. I can't imagine that there would be an activist vice presidency under John Kasich. And and John Hickenlooper, as much as he's been a mayor and a governor and, and certainly is uh, somebody who's activist in their politics, I think that it would be troublesome to a lot of progressives, A, because Hickenlooper is not in lockstep with liberals uh, on issues like fracking, even issues like marijuana, where he, he was in a tough place as the governor of Colorado. You, it, it's a gradual thing there. But the the idea of a unity ticket's fine, but because people are sick of the fighting that goes on in Congress, but I don't think this would change that very much, and I think this would create a very resentful left. Last thing, and then I want to move on to something completely different, but yeah. if you accept, and this is just a, a hypothetical, so maybe listening right now, you may think that, it's, that Donald Trump's presidency isn't so bad, that the media has amplified the problems, and why can't you give this guy a break, and you know, you guys won't give him a chance, whatever. But let's just assume that it's a true dumpster fire. I mean, everything short of a nuclear confrontation, this guy just steps in every bit of dog do all over the world and all over domestic policy. If you accept that and the fact that he's unelectable again, the Democrats still, are they in any position? I mean, they're even in striking distance. Listen, the election for president is not going to happen until 2020. People start lining up at the end of 2018, run all through 2019, and et cetera, et cetera. But I, I do think that both parties are all, always in striking distance. It's so close in America. And the unpopularity of this guy, I mean, my presumption is that the Republicans are going to run from him, not in droves necessarily, but important enough Republicans are going to run from him as it gets closer and as they see themselves vulnerable in House races and Senate races, that it's going to make him even more, you know, I, I would say have an even more tenuous hold on re-election if that's what it comes to. But, you know, are, the, are there Dem there are about 40 Democrats being talked about as possible presidential candidates right now? And while they may not all be, you know, 
Have any of them done TV shows, Michael? Because that's really what it's going to come down to. It really, what I was, what I was getting to is that I think that Jimmy Kimmel is going to be the next guy. <laughs> I'm good with that. I'm oddly good with that. Uh, yeah, well, I think a lot of people would be. And that's, that's the problem, too. Is, I mean, this whole cult of personality, the celebrity worship that we have in this country, I, you know, it, it wears thin historically. It wore thin with Jesse Ventura. It wore thin with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I think that it has an even sort of more loose grip grab on America with Donald Trump. Hey, Amazon, they bought Whole Foods. And you yeah. say, well, this is Amazon growing out of control and, you know, what's happening? Now, Whole Foods pretty expensive already. So, you know, you think... Right. Well, they say that these are going to... It's going to drive down some prices and everyone who's an Amazon Prime member is going to have deep discounts at Whole Foods as well. And that's kind of what I'm getting to. It's starting. They're going to cut prices of bananas, butter, organic eggs, and a lot of other sort of staple items at Whole Foods. All stores are going to lower those prices. And I think that's great. Usually you see you see consolidation and prices go up because of monopolization. And that's that's always the fear with these things. But to lead that way, uh, I'm, I'm, I have more of a crush on Jeff Bezos the more time goes on. That's a dangerous thing to say because he's very powerful. He's very wealthy. He's, um, you know, he's not on the right side of every issue. Uh, but he bought the Washington Post at a time when newspapers were you know, still and are not vogue, but his subscriptions, online subscriptions, have gone through the roof, and he has let them do what I think is probably the finest journalism covering this White House and covering last election that you can imagine. So I think that's great. And if he's doing this and there's access that wouldn't have previously been there to discounts for people who already have this Amazon Prime, I think, you know, I think that's okay. Yeah. Now, I'm really, and I know you are as well, but I'm I'm really going to uh, just underscore it here. Monopolization of so many industries and so many areas in the U.S. now is disgusting to me. It's not, yeah. and, and for everybody who wants a free market, you don't have it anymore. You have the consolidation of media, you have the consolidation of banking, and now you have the consolidation of these huge grocery chains and beyond them. And it's almost the consolidation of free enterprise to the point that it's no longer free. But let me suggest to you that the reason he's cutting those prices at Whole Foods, and I, by the way, share a lot of your same leanings toward Jeff Bezos. He certainly hasn't done anything that I would consider evil since he's right. acquired the world. But I would suggest that the reason he may be dropping those prices is that Walmart is making such a push in this same area. Oh, I mean, he's a businessman, but I'm not dubious of that. Like, so what? I mean, if you own Amazon and Walmart's encroaching upon things and there's a chance for you to be in competition, you know, have at it. That's what it's all about. But to do things in a responsible way, even even the way he's opening brick and mortar bookstores for Amazon now, saying that that you know maybe realizing that Amazon changed the way we read. Now this is a, you know thinking that he's entirely an altruistic person, which of course he's not. But that Amazon has changed the way we read, that we shop for books. It's not interactive. That the, the idea of going, touching a book, reading a book, looking at a book has been compromised, like so many other things, because of Amazon's existence. The whole brick and mortar empire of small mom and pop businesses, you know, is, is fading. They're, they're endangered. I think it's great that he's opening up bookstores. I'm sure he's doing it as a money play and a loss leader for his other businesses, but he does realize that some of that is missing and Amazon's responsible for it. So I think that's cool too. Yeah, fair enough. I guess I was saying that with Google acquiring Walmart, which I didn't mention before, but that's the other part of this, that Google is also right. making its own play with it Walmart. It makes it much easier to search Walmart online. It's, and it's not an acquisition, I should say it's a merger, yeah, that all of a sudden Walmart is a player alongside Amazon in the same space. And then this makes the final point for me, and that is what real competition does. It makes Bezos, or at least it suggests that maybe Bezos is making some moves based on wanting a competitive edge. And if we had competition in a wholehearted way in places like, again, as reviewed, media, banking, and all the rest, you'd right. see more of that kind of thing with your cable bill and with your cell phone bill. With so your I airline just feel like tickets. And an airline ticket, even a better example. So, oh yeah, that's what competition looks like. Yeah. Bezos is lowering prices at Whole Foods because he wants to be competitive with Google and Walmart. Right. Uh, and it's, you know, just to go to the airlines again, Bezos is doing the opposite of what airlines did. So, you know, 
airlines, when they went to the hub and spoke system, they were hubbed rather than just everywhere. They wanted to protect their hubs entirely, which meant that they could control prices entirely. So if you were flying into or out of Dallas, it was only American Airlines. Well, once those hubs were opened up to other airlines, prices went down because Americans couldn't control all of the flights into and out of Dallas in a majority way. And so that's why competition is okay, and that's why these big mergers are often so dangerous. And, you know, the, what Bezos is doing with Whole Foods, and again, Whole Foods is a small player in the in the grocery store world. It shouldn't be overstated what their space, what space they take up, but it's enough of a player that, that Bezos can make attention and make waves with it. Uh, Michael, I am talking to you tonight from the home in Washington, D.C. of my mother and father, where I've come to just... Uh, say hello and spend some time with them and i want to thank you for um for joining us by phone and no i'm happy i'm happy to do it i'm happy that you found a place that would comp you for the on the night of a fight <laughs> if steve Wynn or the mgm people or you know they wouldn't do it at least mom and dad said hey you know what, marky well, we'd love to have you come here for nothing well i'm paying a price in my own way hey um i say to all our friends in texas hang in there we are thinking of you this uh, Hurricane Harvey, brutal. And the most energy and moisture is released from the hurricane when it falls apart. So the soaking flooding is associated with the days that follow the hurricane uh, making landfall. So not to mention that, that we are, in, just to bring it quickly before we say goodbye into politics for one moment, we, you know, the EPA has been gutted by this president. The EPA is responsible for you know, a lot of the cleanup and the analysis and the, the staging of cleanup that happens after storms that affect the environment. And so much petroleum is processed, refined, shipped from that part of the country that should there be any you know, serious disaster down there with these you know, in this area, the EPA is no longer prepared to deal with it. So hopefully, A, it doesn't happen, and B, they figure out how to work with state officials to overcome this. But it's time to get some people in jobs. Yeah, this Hurricane Harvey is actually the first real test of this uh, new administration in response to a natural disaster, and, and it's likely not to be their last test, the way things are going. So, Michael Shore, everybody, the Fast 15. Thanks so much. <laughs> First of all, you know, it's great uh, to be on the show with all of you and all that and all these things. I love it. And if you enjoy listening to The Edge, subscribe to The Edge on iTunes, The Stitcher, and you can totally listen to it on iHeartRadio. Edge-show.com. Edge-show.com. There's a new Showtime series. It's been on all summer. It's called I'm Dying Up Here. It's about the world of the comedy store and the comedy scene in the 70s and early 80s. That was the sweet spot of comedy in many ways in that comics like Robin Williams and David Letterman and Richard Lewis, Jay Leno, Paul Reiser, Elaine Boozler. These were people who achieved a certain momentum and profile at a time that the comedy wave was really cresting. And in L.A., it was the comedy store and the improv, and in New York, it was the improv and Catch a Rising Star. And The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson was all-powerful to make careers. You know the whole deal, and Drew Carey and his overnight success as a result of his Carson appearance, and, and so on. Anyway, during that time, there was a young comedian coming up named Bruce Smirnoff. And this Bruce Smirnoff also spent time on the Comedy Store stage, and he had a lot of other really positive situations find their way to his life, only these situations didn't always turn out so well. And Bruce Smirnoff, our guest in this episode, turned all of those great turn not so great situations into a one-man show. And it was sort of the show for a while. That man joins Heather Ankeny, J. Elvis Weinstein, and me. He is Bruce Smirnoff! Yeah! <laughs> Right. Hi, Mark. Hi, Heather. Hi, Hi Jay. Yeah, and Josh, you're a comic, but you never, you met just briefly, maybe, Bruce? Yeah, like, literally like a quarter century ago, so. Oh, wait a minute. Your name is Josh. I'm sorry I called you Jay. Well, I apologize. My, I, you, you've heard both. It's Jay Elvis Weinstein, a.k.a. Oh, Josh. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Tell Bruce why you're yeah. J. Elvis Weinstein. Because uh, there was already a Josh Weinstein in the Writers Guild when I joined, so I threw in the Elvis to make my initials spell Jew. <laughs> That's funny. And Mark, I, I never met you, and I looked at your biography on Wikipedia, and you're also an Elvis fan, correct? I like Elvis. Yeah. That's on your Wikipedia? Yeah, so. it's on your, it's on it your really? Wikipedia. Please thing. tell it's me like, what num- it says, Bruce. <laughs> 
I don't have it in front of me, but it just says he is a, a big. That might be. A, I think that might be the other Mark Thompson. But uh, but look, Bruce, you're a great story, and here's why. <laughs> tell him why. Let me tell you, Bruce, what is great about your life. <laughs> your life has taken you through the juiciest parts of show business. How old were you when you first came to L.A.? I moved there on October 2nd, 1978, which was my 22nd birthday. And the one problem with it was that I wasn't ready. I had I had a really good look, but I, I wasn't battle tested. I had been doing stand-up sporadically in Boston through my college years. I went to Boston University, but I had stars in my eyes. And I moved to L.A. and a lot of people came to see me because I had this I have a funny face, whatever, I have a funny look. And I totally wasn't ready. So that began the uh, the the horror show, uh, which lasted pretty much uh, 23 years. Oh, no. <laughs> well, was it Mitzi who was running the comedy store at the time? Was she the? Well, that was the place you wanted to be. I mean, in fact, the first night I moved there, I went to the comedy store. I paid a I paid admission because I mean I didn't know anybody, and uh, it was audition night. And the one guy who struck me was the late and great Gary Shandling. And he was just breaking into becoming a regular at that time. And you could just see the talent uh, that, that he had. And uh, of course, compared to a lot of the, the amateurs that were going on, it was, it was head and shoulders. And I remember that night and I was afraid to audition at the comedy store. And then about three or four months later, I was having coffee. Is that, is the Hyatt house still next door at that hotel? The hotel is there. It's not the Hyatt house anymore, but yeah. It's not the Hyatt, but it was called the Hyatt house. So I was there with Mitchell Walters, another comedian who was trying to help me with my act, help me like on the first five minutes. We're having coffee. And at the next table was Mitzi Shore, who the owner of the comedy store, the queen of comedy you know the a number one back in those days yeah at that time she was really to give people a sense of it she was like the gatekeeper to a career almost oh yeah oh oh you can't say comedy bud friedman had arrived i believe in 1977 but his club was really um based on freddie prince i believe the story goes as he opened it because he had a special relationship with freddie and freddie was going to come over and and perform there but unfortunately freddie passed away uh, almost, I guess, within a few months of the improv opening. So the improv was in fits and starts, but the comedy store was, was exploding. On a Monday night there, you could go, they had three rooms, and it was the main room, the original room, and the belly room, and there was a line to get into any one of those rooms because really everybody wanted to come and see Robin Williams. The, the day I moved to Los Angeles was like the fourth week of Mork and Mindy, so he was already, you know, the the talk of the of the United States, and it, it was just a, the greatest period of time to be a stand-up comic. So, Not for me, but so, for everybody else. Yes. <laughs> so you're sitting there though, and so this yeah. this All right, queen so of this place is right next to you. Mitchell Walters and Mitzi Shore pays her check, and she comes walking by the table to say hello to Mitchell, and then she like looks at me and goes, "Who are you? That face." What a face you have. I go, hi, I'm Bruce Smirnoff. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you're Mitzi Shaw. I, I've always wanted to have you see me, but I'm not ready for you. And she goes, I know talent. I don't care about what you think. I know talent. I will see that face on my stage Monday night. Well, <laughs> you, you, I, I can't tell you how excited I was to, to, to have this lead in like that. And then she gave me prime time Monday night about 9.15. And the room was explosive. And I went on. And I didn't get one laugh because I had no idea oh, what I was no. doing. And I was so nervous and I just died. And being very polite, I always was very polite. I went up to her after my show and she sits in the back of the room and she's got like a cadre of comedians around her. And I said, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to perform here. And she just looked at me and she goes, you have no talent. <laughs> Don't even think about being a stand-up comedian. And that was, that was off and running. Oh, that was it. No. You but, were supposed to make the face say something funny. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I I never worked at the comedy store through those those halcyon days. Uh, I did wind up. I mean, it has a happy ending. We don't have to go there now. But uh, you know, in the in the mid nineties, I became like a big big name there. So it has a good name. But 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 again, that opened up the the gates to. Uh, a long struggle in uh, Los Angeles. Yeah, and, and we'll, we'll, we're going to touch on a couple of those things, and it is kind of, I'm glad you said it, important to know that Bruce is fine and doing really well and everything. <laughs> oh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a great life. I live in Delray Beach, Florida, which most of your listeners have no idea where this is. It's 
10 miles from Boca Raton, Florida. If you still don't know, it's 35 miles from Fort Lauderdale and it's 58 miles from Miami Beach. So I, that's still don't know. I still don't know. I still don't know. I, it's on the other side of the United States and it's flat. Gotcha. Thank you. Now, this Mitchy thing, though, did anything but lay you out. You actually went on to some incredible situations. I mean, I remember from your one man show. Let that- me tell that the title of it so they have an idea of yeah. where it's going. The show is called Other Than My Health. I have nothing. (laughs) And today I don't feel so good. And the show premiered in 1995 and uh, it ran for like three years sporadically. And you must have come uh, during that period. Do you remember where you saw it, Mark? It was a smaller, God, it's smaller venue, I think. Um, was it at the Comedy Store or was it on Sunset Boulevard? No, it was not at the Comedy Store. So uh, that's so all it was I, in a theater then? Yeah, it was in a the theater. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, uh, I did it in about four different theaters and I did do it in the belly room of the Comedy So it had many different venues that it ran, but it, it uh, they were all very good venues. Where and so when so, you went back to the Comedy Store and did it, was that like a special moment? Uh, Mitzi was a... Mitzi is still with us, thank God. She's not, not doing that good, but she's uh, you know got a lot of love around her. Got to remember, I... I, due to my immaturity and my anger, and you know, as any comic is, as, as you know, Josh, we have a lot of a lot of anger in us. A lot of anger. I didn't obviously. I was very angry at her. I was really angry at myself. But rather than taking responsibility for myself, I hated her and I detested her and I, you know, and I, I, I wished bad thoughts, all that stuff. Because listen, no one likes to get rejected. But uh, uh, I mean, we're going through so many years. If I want to fast forward to. Here's the interest. This is how I, you want to hear how I got back in the comedy store is what you want to hear, right? Oh, I just, yeah, when you did, if it was all, I guess all, yeah, back. All right. Well, what happened was I was doing these, um, in the Jewish religion, there's a holiday called Purim and, uh, it's a mirth and merriment thing. And I was doing these uh, shows for this rabbi who's a very enlightened rabbi uh, from Chabad in the high center in Los Angeles. And, and for about three years, he picked the comedy store as his venue. So we would get the room and we would put on a show and you get all these Jewish people to come in and laugh and all this stuff. And we would do this three years. And I was like, by then, by 1991, 92, 93, I had gotten very funny, but I had this legacy of a failure prior to all this. So no one really took me seriously. By the way, that's a good name for a one-man show. Legacy (laughs) Legacy of Failure. I like that. I got lots of titles for it. You betcha. (laughs) Anyway. So we had done it three years in a row and I I was always like the highlight of the show. And the thing is, is Mitzi would come to watch the show and when I would go on, she'd be so disgusted at me that she would just get up and leave the room because in her eyes, there's no way I could possibly be funny. And of course, she would leave the room. I would kill... And again, at this point, I really just didn't care anymore. And it was just a shame. So like by the third year, the rabbi and his wife came to me and said, hey, we're at the comedy store. We want to do the show again. I said, absolutely, rabbi. But let me just tell you the irony. You know, the Mitzi is so generous in giving you the room. But she, she, she hates me. And I mean, she doesn't see how funny you see me and the other people see me. It's just, it's just very sad that way. So anyway, I go on. I do the show. I look towards Mitzi's. A, a booth while I'm on stage. I'm killing. And of course, she's not there. Whatever. I get off stage. I walk back and this is in the main room of the store. And there's Mitzi in the uh, in the main room, in the dressing room. And she goes, you are phenomenal. I don't know what you did, but you got great. I want you here from now on. Call in tomorrow. So what had happened was when she got up to leave, the rabbi's wife grabbed her on the arm, wouldn't let her go and took her off to another area and made her watch me. And, uh, you know, you know, you can get all spiritual and everything, but that was really a, a very nice, uh, they call it a mitzvah. And it was done by then, I guess, because I was doing my mitzvah to make people laugh on the holiday. I'm not a religious sort of guy, but that was a, a very nice uh, moment. And from that day on, you got to understand from that day on, I was like in the top echelon of the comics at the comedy store. We get the main room on Saturday, Friday. I get the OR every night if I wanted it. It was, it was unbelievable. And I would, I would go to Mitzi's house. She'd invite me up. She lived up on, um, I think they think they sold the house up on Doheny. And I would sit there with her. And because I was already like, you know, in my mid forties and all these other comics were much younger than me. And, you know, she knew I, my family was in the entertain, like in the hospitality business. So she would talk to me about 
you know, uh, cover charges and entertainment and things like that. And I'd talk to her like like a business person. And I'd sit there going, I used to hate this woman. And now we're like uh, we're like best friends. So it had a very happy ending. That is wild. A poor America. Yeah, wild. <laughs> poor wild. America. Yeah, right. If you, if you can't find God after that, Josh, <laughs> you can't find it. I'll put my grogger away when I hear Mitzi's name. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bruce, after getting bounced by Mitzi, you still had like all these uh, juicy moments. Oh. Now, you did a show with Carol O'Connor. And at the time, he was hot off of All in the Family. They did a spinoff from All in the Family. All in the Family was a number one show in America for however long it was on. And then they took Carol O'Connor and they gave him his own show, right? Yes. Now, yeah. I haven't told this story in probably about 15 years. It's a tough one. It's 1981. And All in the Family has been replaced by this show called Archie Bunker's Place. It's Edith is, I believe, dead. So it's really him. And it's he's got a bar and it's still the number one rated show on television, uh, but it's an entirely new cast. And one of the new members is his uh, lawyer uh, named Rabinowitz. Now, they're casting for this part and they must have hired this guy, Rabinowitz, the actor. And for whatever reason, it didn't work out and they had to fire him and they've got to replace him because the taping is on, I guess, Friday and it's like Wednesday. So they got to find somebody really fast. And it's Yom Kippur. I hate having to go back to being Jewish all the time. But a lot of things fall on these holidays. So this is Yom Kippur. This is a day where even Jews who aren't Jews pretend that they're Jews because it's a holy, holy day. So, But they need this character. So they call APA, which is a huge agent. You know that, Josh and Mark. And they, and they call APA. There's nobody at APA except for this one guy, Jeff Thal, who had to be there because they had to have somebody in the office because you just have to because the rest of show business does go on. And so they get the call. We need a tall, skinny lawyer blah, blah, to play that. So he looks at the APA clients. He doesn't see anybody right for it. But he went to college with me. He knows me in L.A. He goes, I want to send in this Bruce Smirnoff. They send me in. I read for the director. I believe his name was Gary Shimakawa, Shimakawa, something like that. And whatever it was, God was, uh, I guess, on my shoulder, even though it was a major holiday. You're not supposed to be working. And they <laughs> hire me like on the spot. So I'm going to be one of the supporting characters on on Archie Bunker's place. My life just went from zero to like 100 and I couldn't sleep that night. I go into CBS and I and I'm, and I'm just so nervous while I'm standing on the soundstage and I'm going up to the stage manager and I'm going, I can't believe I got this job. He goes, hey, this is great. Don't even think about that now. You're one of us. And I go, I know, but this is like all the biggest stars on this show. It's, it's not just Carol O'Connor. It's Ann Mira. It's Billy Halep. Mark, do you remember the Bowery Boys? Billy Halep was one of the Bowery Boys. So that was like one of the most exciting things. And I go to the stage manager and I go, but to Carol O'Connor, I mean, I remember seeing him in 19... 19- 71 when that show premiered and oh my god to see him out and the stage manager goes well put it all aside because there he is right and they're walking towards me is you know my idol archie bunker carol o'connor and he just comes up to me and, he says, hey, Dan. and i say oh he's a tall one i gotta be looking up at you and he walks away and i look at the stage manager and i go wow he barely speaks he was like whispering he goes oh you don't know that about carol o'connor not only is he the nicest man in show business but he whispers. He barely speaks. We have to like overmodulate his microphone when we're doing the show. And I'm going like, wow, not only did I get to meet my idol, but I'm learning <laughs> trivia facts about him. So we go on, we start rehearsing. And basically the, my, my introductory scene is I, he's sitting behind his desk in, at the restaurant. And I come in and I go, uh, look, Bunker, I'm paraphrasing here. Your partner Murray wants to sell his half of the bar it was Martin Balsam, the actor. He goes, you can't afford to buy him out. I suggest you sell. He goes, oh, geez, there Rabinowitz, you're a Jew. Can't you Jews figure something out for me to do? And I go, bunker, knock it off. And then we start, we start our fight back and forth. So, okay, so now we take lunch and I'm sitting there and I'm so stunned that I've got this gig that I, I can't even eat. I'm in shock. I'm And everyone can, can understand. So I'm sitting there with just, I couldn't eat. I had no appetite, but I, I had yogurt and I have like a teaspoon, one of those plastic teaspoons. And I'm just touching the top of the yogurt with the teaspoon and dabbing my tongue. And I'm just killing time while everybody else is eating. And then the director waves me over with the producer and they, they go, sit down, sit down. I go, me? Yeah, sit down, sit down. I go, how does it feel? I go, it's... I, I don't know what you mean exactly. Come on, we know who you are. You're like a nothing. What do you work at the improv at <laughs> two o'clock in the morning? You're going to be known on the number one sitcom in the United States. And it's like they're throwing gasoline 
onto a fire. They're getting me so jacked up. I go, You're absolutely right. And I run away and I go to the dressing room and I start calling everyone I've ever hated in my life. <laughs> And I start, I'm just like going to, hey, you remember me from, from fifth grade? You wouldn't go out with me? You called me a, a frog? Huh? I got the show. I just took it out on everybody. It was killing me how, how, how on top of the world I was. So now we break for dinner and we come back and we're doing what's called a full dress rehearsal because yeah. we're taping the next morning. And what they do is they get all the uh, employees at CBS and they come in and we do the show. And, um, you know, it's like uh, you see, you know where the laughter is because it, it is it's tape before a live audience. So we do the show. I go to my scene. I come in. Oh, geez, there, Bunker. You know, your partner, uh, Murray, wants to sell his half of the bar. You can't afford to buy him out. I suggest you sell. And he goes, oh, geez, there, Rabinowitz, you're a Jew. And I go, Bunker, knock it off. Now, seemingly, because you don't remember what I said before, you don't know what's happened. But I've started my line before he finished his, which is calling going up on the other actor. Heather, That's have you ever done that? Gone up on the other actor? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Heather was just in Criminal big... Minds, and you didn't have an episode like that? No. Okay. Anyway, go ahead, Bruce. All so right. So that's like a big, big no no to do. And the nicest man in show business went off like Mount Vesuvius. And he just gets up and he just stops his character and he just goes, who the hell hired this green piece of blank? He's nothing but a green banana. Get him out of here right now. And like at that moment, about four people jumped on me like they jumped on John Hinckley after he shot President Reagan. And they just take me off the soundstage and they take me down the hallway and they put me in a broom closet, literally like a maintenance closet. And I'm there. I'm so sorry. I just I'm so nervous. I didn't know what I did. I did it wrong. I know. Just give me another chance. And they just go wait here. Meanwhile, Dante's. Inferno hasn't stopped. You can hear him <laughs> screaming down the hall. I want to know who brings in less than eight hours before taping. Who brings in this lousy, rotten, amateur comic? And, and so finally, about 15 minutes goes by, and these guys come back, and they go, uh, Mr. Smirnoff, would you come back out on the set? And I come back out on the set, and Carol O'Connor comes walking up to me. Oh, jeez. I'm really sorry. I, you know, we, we fired the other guy. We didn't have time. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Shakes my hand. Let's get it together. I go, okay, no problem. So now we do the scene again. Everything is cool. Stage manager comes up to me and he goes, okay, so we're taping uh, 10 a.m. tomorrow. Excuse me, we tape at 12 noon tomorrow. Be here 10 a.m. for makeup. I'll see you later. And I go, no problem. I go home and I am now so, so excited, so amazed. I, I, I can't sleep. This is like changing my entire life. Yeah, you're gonna be in virtually every home in America when the show airs. Exactly. So I get up at six o'clock in the morning, I go to the farmer's market, cause it's right next to CBS where they tape it, and I'm having coffee. I think I was at the farmer's market before they even opened up. And I, I kill some time there. I'm supposed to be at CBS at 10, but fine, I couldn't take it anymore. At 8 a.m., I run over to CBS, I go onto the sound stage, and nobody's there, except for the stage manager. And he's like looking at me, I'm looking at him, I go, hey, and he goes, Hi. I go, hey, hey, come on, wake up. I know it's early, but, you know, have some coffee, smell the roses. And he's just looking at me because he doesn't know why I'm there because what's happened is they have fired me and they had called my house probably at 7 a.m. to tell me not to show up. But too late. I left at 6 and this is before cell phones or anything. So he doesn't know why I'm there and why I'm so happy. So he can't tell me I'm fired because there's a protocol in our business. The agent has to call you. So what does he do? He takes me to the makeup room. So unbeknownst to me, man, I'm still on the show and I'm in the makeup room and I'm laughing and I got the, you know, <laughs> the two napkins in my neck while they're putting on mascara and I'm laughing with the makeup artist. I'm going, you know, I read where Al Jolson said, it's all in the <laughs> eyes. So can you give me highlight a little eyeshadow under the eyes and then maybe put a little mascara? And they're just like looking at me like, who is this psycho? And every so often people are walking by the doorway to the makeup room and they're doing double takes. They're like coming back looking and I'm going, see that? See all those people stopping and looking? They're looking at the new star at CBS. And I have now become the talk of the building. And the next thing I know, there's a security guard, I'd say he's about six foot two, standing in the doorway with his arms akimbo. And I go, how do you like this? Not only am I the new star at CBS, 
I got my own security. And I'm like, like kibitzing with this guy. I'm going, hey, giant. Hey, what's it? Come on in. You want a cup of coffee? And the guy's just standing there staring at me. I go, all right. I guess you're not paid to talk to the actors. You just do your job and guard me. And it goes on. Finally, uh, they go, uh, Mr. Smirnoff, there's a phone call for you out on the set. And I go, well, OK, but look. There's a four line telephone. Send it through. And they go, no, Mr. Smirnoff, we prefer you take it out on the set. So I walk out onto the set. Now, at this point, everybody's there, all the gaffers, the grippers, the soundstage, check, test one, two, check, check. Everything is going on, this whole hubbub. I take one step onto the soundstage. The entire place is frozen. And I still got about 25 feet to walk to the telephone. And they're staring at me. I'm looking at them. And I'm taking these steps going, uh oh. Something's wrong. This isn't good. I'm in a lot of trouble. And I get to the phone, and on the other end is the casting director, Jane Murray. I think I have to remember all these years later. And I go, "Hello." And she goes, "Honey, oh, oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry, honey. There's been a mistake. They had to replace you. Um, it had nothing to do with your ability, but they, they had to go another way. And, and you know what? I'm, I'm putting you in uh, uh, the facts of life next week. You're gonna, you're gonna have a guest star on that. So you've got to go home now, honey. Just leave the set, and uh, we're gonna have that script messenger over. And I just want you to know it had nothing to do with your ability. And I, I took like a beat." Because I had been in acting classes and you hear these horrible stories, but of course nothing ever happens to you. But they always tell you that when something like this happens, you can't react angrily or, or negatively. And I just took the phone. I said, Jane, it was a pleasure working with such professional people. And I hung up the phone. And at this point, everybody on the set now realized there was no, I wasn't there on any malicious problem or anything. And they were all being very, hey, are you okay? And I'm going, hey, I'm fine. Everything's good. I'm going home now. I'm getting a, a script from the facts of life. I'm going to be guest starring on that. And I, looked, I looked at everybody and I said, I just want to all tell you all, it was a pleasure working with such professional people. And I went home and I waited. And that script from the facts of life, it never came. That was just a way for them to kind of like entice me to get off the set. And I don't mean to be maudlin here, but I really don't remember about 48 hours of my life after that. I would have and been decimated by that, yeah. And, who, and do you, who do you call different. or who do you talk to after that? Well, the hardest part was I had to call back all those people that I had rubbed it into and I had to tell them that I got fired. So I guess that was the karma uh, uh, message to me to uh, not not gloat over things and, and get uh, take everything out of um, proportion. Bruce, what a weird thing because for them to replace you, well, obviously it was at O'Connor's insistence, although the sin of running up on his line during rehearsal, especially after you followed it with a smooth rehearsal, is pretty minuscule. I know. But, that, but, that just but seemed, yeah. for them to fire Bruce like right before the next day they're going to be taping. So you got to get somebody in there. They're already replacing him with Bruce because they're on a tight schedule. Now you got to get, you know, some guy like J. Elvis well, Weinstein they, to come I'll in. I'll tell you who right. they hired. I'll tell you, and I'll tell you a follow-up to it. Uh, they hired Barry Gordon, who is a very, very skilled, terrific actor. And, and if you saw, you don't know the face to a name, if you saw him, you'd go, oh, my God, I know who he is. And now I believe he was president of SAG, you know, years later. And then I believe he ran for Congress in the San Fernando Valley. I don't know whether he won or not. But anyway, terrific actor. He, you know, played on the whole, uh, you know, I think the show won about five years and he was on it uh, all five years. He became, a, you know, the major character that that hopefully I was going to be. But the weird thing is about 1999, I'm at the pavilions on Santa Monica Boulevard in, <laughs> in West Hollywood. <laughs> He's in front of me in the checkout line. Okay. So he didn't know how to take it, but he's standing there and he looks at me and I smile at him and he smiles at me. I go, hi, Barry. And he goes, hi. I go, Barry, I got to tell you a story <laughs> because of my failure. You got that job on Archie Bunker's place. And that led to, you know, a very substantial part of your career. And I just, you know, I just said that and I had this big smile on my face. And again, when someone says that to you, you know, they fired me and hired you and you got the big career. The guy thinks I'm going to like come, you know, come after him with, I don't know how he thought, but he gave me sure. that look like, oh my God, I think this guy's going to hit me or Well, something. yeah, yeah. There's that moment where you don't know how he's going to take it. And now right, he's, he and he right. just kind of looked at me and said, oh, I'm so sorry. I go, not a problem. I just wanted to let you know I'm the guy they fired and you know, no harm, no foul. You deserved it. You're a great actor. And that was that, but I do remember that moment God. before he looked at me like that. What yeah. an, and how your life is sort of, uh, has got these, has been punctuated by these moments where you're just decimated. I mean, just laid out. That story you just told, I mean, 
you know, again, you're right on the verge of just busting out into the open, and then this bizarre thing happens. It really was nothing that you did, I mean, in any kind of substantial way. Mm-mm. Right, Heather? I mean, you you know, you're an actress. You know this. Well, yeah. I shouldn't know. I shouldn't know my lines. I should Heather, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, you. it's Go fine. Ahead. I just, I think I, a lot worse has happened. <laughs> I, I don't believe I studied my lines hard enough in the, um, you know, in the, in the rehearsal process. So it, I take full responsibility for it. We're talking about six, seven lines and, you know, your nerves and all that. But again, it was my fault. And I guess they saw something else in my demeanor that maybe I was hesitant or whatever it was. O'Connor had at this point, he had complete control of the yeah. show. Right. I think he just, how long was Archie? How long was Car- all in the family on 11 years, yeah. maybe more? Yeah. And top of the ratings. 71, was- yeah, 71 to 80. So maybe 81. So at least nine or 10 years. So then this this incarnation came. So, yeah, the weird part, Mark, about these stories is that's not even the worst story. No, I just have say, like hundreds of these horrible, horrible <laughs> incidences that happened to me. I'm a gambler, okay? And uh, in gambling, you'll hear a lot of stories. And there is an unwritten rule, and that is don't tell me a story about how you won a lot of money. Tell me a story about how you lost a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. and, and, and Bruce, I, I thought of that knowing that you were coming on because I think that there is a part of all of us that goes, God, we were so close to such and such. I mean, all, all of us in this room, and many people who've been through this room, have stories of how close we came if it hadn't been for this. I mean, can you believe this happened and I got screwed out of all of that? or something? And so I think on some level we can all relate to it. But having said that, you did get pulverized by some <laughs> of the biggest moments in all of show business. You had a run in with Johnny Carson. And at the time, he was at the height of his powers also. I was going to tell you that I did do this show, this one man show that we mentioned before. And this was, like you said, it was like it was a hot ticket to get in Los Angeles. It was always a standing ovation. I had people, I almost had Warren Beatty and uh, Gary Shandling came. Because, you know, Sarah Silverman, obviously, she saw my show a few times and she was very good friends with with Warren and, and Gary. And she told me one night, it was over at a mutual friend's house, we we're watching TV. And she goes, you know, the other night your show, you were like five minutes away from Warren Beatty coming in with Gary Shandling and sitting in the front row. And I said, what happened? He goes, well, they were, I convinced them to go. They were ready to go. And then he got some phone call, whatever. There was some kind of woman <laughs> situation and they ran off with a, a woman, whatever. But I can't go into details on that, but they didn't come. But just the thought that, that just Sarah, you know, uh, talking me up to these two guys and they were ready to uh, to come to the show. It was very, uh, yeah, but uh, you know. what, what I love about that story is they were going to come hear about these disappointments, but ultimately they didn't because he got a call. And so that's a disappointing story also a little bit. No, I mean, what were they? No, listen, no, no. I know you didn't tell it that way, were, but what I, were they going to do? They weren't going to do anything. I had some very big, I'm again, I have 95 to 150 addendums and stories and all this, but it was just a follow up to what you were telling me. You said, my goodness, people like to hear these stories. Well, in L.A., they went nuts over this. It was so close that I, I almost got a, a sitcom. I had the meetings. I had the agents. I had all this. And again, obviously, if you didn't see it because it didn't happen. But this but is it, following your one-man close. show. You said you had, you're you saying you have all this heat on you. I had a lot of heat on me. The problem was Jerry Seinfeld's sh- show had ended. And then uh, so when I, when I was going to the networks with this show, it was... It was very close to, to the idea of, uh, you know, about a little comic who can't make it in Hollywood and all his friends and all that. The problem was it was the Larry David show, Curb Your Enthusiasm. They had done the pilot and it was not like exactly because Larry David was a completely different character, but it was so similar that I just it just got shut down. So I'm just saying that. But I, I just wanted to say something about the one man show in itself. We tried to tour it around the country. And I just wanted to say you were wrong in about how everyone wants to hear these stories. When I would do this show in L.A., standing <laughs> ovation, great. people would go crazy. Everyone went nuts. When I did this show in Ohio and I did it in Missouri or I did it in Arizona, people walked out of the show. It was one of the biggest bombs because people don't under, people didn't believe me. First of all, they didn't believe these stories because it's <laughs> Carol O'Connor. If you're a normal person, you just think that Carol O'Connor is this great guy and Johnny Carson could never be the way Johnny Carson was in my story. And they just looked at me as like, well, if this guy 
He's a loser. He should have known when he was 21 years old that nobody wanted him. So he should have become a plumber or maybe, a, you know, you know, another profession. So they don't understand that in show business, it's built on a bed of failures. And then one one time you break through and then the rest is history. So well, that that's was, interesting. That just, mm-hmm. to, just, to, just to follow up on what you had said, people but, didn't want to hear these. They used to come up to me at the end of the show and go, why would you say that about Carol O'Connor? I go, what are you talking about? I could be sued. I, I mentioned names. I said all these b- despicable things about him. If these weren't true, I'd be sued. Oh, no, he would never be like that. So people just turned off. Regular people would turn the show off uh, midstream because they just didn't get it. Oh, that's so, wild to know. Gosh. Yeah. I did this show in Florida in 2010 because I, I my present situation is I'm still a comedian. I work a lot on cruise ships. I never broke through, so nobody really knows me, but I've gotten fairly good. And I work on these (laughs) cruise ships and I work in these condominiums here in South Florida. So I've got like a mini following. Uh, It's a homogeneous following. It's like elderly Jewish people from the Northeast that all live down here. So someone thought it would be a good idea to present this show. And uh, I did. And I had an amazing, you know, first night I had almost 700 people in the theater. And I started telling these stories. And within 20 minutes, they were all sleeping. That's how bad <laughs> they were all. And I'm going, holy mackerel, this is a failure. I, because these people only know me as the one-liner comedian in the Schmendrick character that I have. But they don't want to hear these stories. And again, these are people that were not in show business and I, I just can remember that night how, how miserable it bombed. Yeah, so there you go. Wow, that's wild. I think this is sort of a gossipy society, so I'm kind of surprised that people would want to go, hey, I met Gwyneth Paltrow in the elevator. Let me tell you something. She's not all she's cracked up to be. You know what I mean? Uh, so it's sort of weird that people react, just feed me my image of Bill Cosby. I think, it's prob- I think it probably has changed a bit, too, in the, in the, in the last 20 years, too, in that people are, you know, everyone is in show business now in their head, and everyone is seeking their own fame now. So I'm not saying take it back out of the road. The problem with that, Josh, is these people are so gone and dead that people that are under 40 under 45 years old they don't even know who these no, people no, I'm, are. I'm just i'm just they saying don't know. yeah yeah i'm not saying that i'm not saying that the show is more viable not, not to be offensive <laughs> but i'm just saying i'm just saying that i think culture has changed in fact and i totally agree with what you're saying is that people don't want insider baseball necessarily they want it they, now they want right. they want to have their suspicions confirmed yeah i'll give you some inside baseball here we met, we were talking about seinfeld so in 1992, there's a writer, a comic named Fred Stoller. Either one of you know him? Sure. Any of you? Fred's been on the okay, show so, twice. Yeah. Okay, so did he tell you about... He told us about his year on Seinfeld, but he didn't mention uh, your connection to Seinfeld or his episode. Okay. I, I so think I know what it is, but I'm excited to hear what it is. Yeah, so, and again, this, this is like a badge of dishonor because <laughs> it's like it, it could have so easily been a badge of honor but because of the character, they turned it into whatever. I'll, I'll tell you the story. So I start lifting weights in 1990, and I'm taking that creatine. So I actually got bigger. My arms got bigger. My chest got bigger. So I outgrew my 40 long sport coats and my suits. And I and I wanted to give them away, but I didn't want to take them to Goodwill because I'll be honest with you, they were like Armani suits. And I didn't feel like seeing a homeless guy walking down, you know, Beverly Drive in, in an Armani suit that was mine. So I call up Fred Stoller because he's the same. He was the same size. And I go, Fred, I got these suits. You want them? Oh, yeah, sure. So I, I meet him and I give him like these three suits. And he goes, how can I repay you? I go, Fred, don't worry about it. I say, if it really means anything to you, you can take me uh, for dinner. And he goes, why are you giving me these suits? I go, look at my arms, Fred, I'm huge. And I'm like, just having a fun time with him. I go, look at my arms. So he calls me about a week later at 11 o'clock at night. And he goes, why don't you come and meet me at Jerry's Deli? And I go, okay, I'll come and meet you. So I go and I meet him there. It's 11.15 now. He goes, I want to get you your dinner. And I go, I'll be honest with you, Fred, it's 11.15. (laughs) I ate already. I want a bowl of soup, but I don't want this soup to count as my dinner because I think you're trying to chisel me. So I'm not, I'm just going to have soup. I'll pay for it, but you still owe me the dinner. And, you know, and that was it. And I, I don't re- Fred was not really, I liked him and we were friendly, but we were not best friends. I was his buddy because I wanted to get rid of the suits and I wanted to give them to a fellow comedian. So now it's like four years later and I get a phone call from, from Seinfeld. They go, we want you to read. Basically we wrote a part 
and it's about you. So we want you to read for you. And the part was this guy, Banya. You know who he was on the sure. show? Uh, Steve so Heitner. Steve uh, Heitner, Heitner, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And so I go in and I'm sitting there with, the, not with Jerry, but with Mark Schwartz, the casting director, and Larry David. You know, and I'm sitting there with these guys and I'm reading my own words. I'm going, look at my arms. I'm huge. <laughs> And so how do so you screw tur- it up? I'm just being me. <laughs> and um, and and they didn't give it to me. They gave it to, to Steve Heitner. I guess he they thought he was a better me than me. And that character, you know, he's his some of his catchwords is, you know, it's gold, Jerry. And I used to I used to go around all the time when I heard a good joke. I used to go, that's gold. That's phenomenal. And and so a lot of the dialogue from the character's mouth is from me. So, so yes. That so was- they wrote a Seinfeld episode about the story where you're giving your suits away, but you get well, too Fred big for it. Yeah, Fred yeah, wrote it. Yeah, Fred episode. wrote it. You come in an audition for you in this role. Only you don't get the part. They give it to I Steve I got a Heitner. call back. I did get a call back, and it was between me and Steve Heitner, and they went with Steve. Now, what so, did they yeah. say to you? Or what did Fred say to you? Hey, uh, sorry. Uh, oh, you can't. You know, whatever it is, you reach a professional. You can't do that stuff. Yeah, you know, you, go, I'm hey, in a business. you just can't. You can't. And you know something? I even tr- I when I first started out, I would do stuff like that. If I didn't get a thing, you'd call the agent. Go, what was the matter? Did I do something wrong? You can't do that. You yeah. can't have nine thousand people asking why you didn't get it. Somebody else was better than you. You'd live live another day. If you think you're that great, study harder and uh, get it next time. I didn't have that attitude back then, but that, that is a professional attitude. Yeah. I hope I get that attitude someday. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have it yet. I don't say that attitude applies anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but Bruce, you had a, an encounter with Johnny Carson. Yes, I did. Uh, <laughs> as we all know, it was every comic's dream to be on The Tonight Show because Johnny had a thing. I think mean, it, it's still proven every every day since. Jay Leno was like the worst for comedians. He, he I think he did his best to not break anybody new and those that he broke were probably were carrot top and fluky guys because whatever, Jay had a thing. Letterman broke some comics but nobody broke comics like Johnny Carson. He truly wanted the comic to succeed and, and uh, everyone grew up you know, without Ed Sullivan, you knew that this was this was the way to go. And Johnny, as you know, uh, all of you, he had these hand signals. You know, if you just did great and he just liked you, he would clap and maybe wave. But if he really liked you, he gave you the thumbs up. And if he loved you, he'd give you the wave. Yeah, come here, come here, come here. And you'd sit on the couch with him. And that meant, you know, you, you totally made it. I mean, this was every comic's dream so it's now that would really like kick the door open for a lot of comics i mean drew carey ellen degeneres gary shandling etc right totally i mean it made people overnight it was huge it's 1983 and if you remember he was arrested for drunk driving do you remember that yes or no yes yeah okay so he was arrested like i don't know on a tuesday and it was a big thing and he didn't come back on the show all week and he came back like the following Tuesday. And you can see this on YouTube if you want, because it, it's so funny because now we're so used to the the, the, the the stigma about drunken driving and the mothers against drunk driving. When he came on to do his monologue a week after getting arrested um, for drunk driving, do you know how he came on stage? Do you happen to remember? I think a police officer brought him on or something. Two CHP police officers bring him out on stage in handcuffs, and the audience is cheering. They're cheering the drunk driver. They're going, <laughs> hey oh, hey oh, and everyone's laughing. They cut to the band. The band is falling down on their knees, and the cops are standing. Then the cop, the cops undo the um, the handcuffs on him. You know, and you know when you get the handcuffs undone, you rub your. You know how the convict rubs his wrist, or Johnny rubs his wrist. It's unbelievable, and they're hey oh. And it's so, so it's that week. And uh, so Josh, those are not real cops, by the way. I, just <laughs> no. I, I thought that one looked like Pat McCormick. Yeah, go, go. <laughs> Sorry, Bruce. Go ahead. So it's now the Saturday after this, uh, his comeback on television. And I guess and I'm at the improv. Now, at this point, I I'm still not really a good comedian and I'm semi doorman at the improv. And I go on at five minutes to two almost every night, you know, and usually it's on after Robin Williams. So my audience is sometimes like three or four people making out or so high, they don't even know where they are. So, you know, but I always get there early because you just never know. And I get there, you know, at eight o'clock because I love to hang out. The improv, as you remember it back then, it had a bar in the front along with a restaurant and lots of people hung out there, especially on a Saturday night. So it's like a a clubhouse for comics. 
a clubhouse for comics, actors, just everybody. And then, you know, who's who and who's there. And because, this, cause, you know, Robin Williams would be there and Jay Leno and all these, all these heavy hitters back in the 1983. So I'm there, I'm just, just another Saturday night waiting for my five minutes at five minutes to two. And a black Mercedes pulls up and the door opens up and out steps Johnny Carson. Okay. Now, as weird as it may seem, remember it's 1983. The improv has been in Los Angeles since 19, I believe late 76. Johnny Carson has never been to the improv and he, he's, he walks in and as he walks in, the place is packed and there have been big stars, you know, Robin Williams, all these movie stars come into the improv. When Johnny Carson put like three feet into the improv, just people in the restaurant and the bar, they gave him a standing ovation, not in the showroom, just people just standing around. They just started applauding and whistling. And he like looks around, he barely acknowledges the people. Cause if you look at him, you see there's a little weirdness in his eye and he goes right up to the bar and everybody like moves out of his way. And he orders three shots of, I think Jack Daniels uh, whiskey. And I'm standing about, like uh, like three feet from him because this is my idol. I mean, this is every every comic's idol. And you know what I noticed about him? Uh, he wasn't small like most people that you see on TV and then you see them in real life. He was about six feet tall, had really broad athletic shoulders. And the other thing I noticed about him was he liked to drink. He took those three shots of whiskey and he just went glug, glug, glug. And he turned around walked right by me and he went down the hallway into the showroom. And it was just so special, such an amazing moment. And I'm like watching this and I said, wow, whoever is on stage right now has no idea that they're about to be seen by Johnny Carson. And then of course the comic part of me kicks in. It should be me. How come it's not me? How come it's always somebody else that gets that break and it's never me? Because it's always me in a stand-up selfish life. Well, no, th sooner than I had thought those electrons, thoughts into my brain, Bud Friedman, the owner of the improv, he taps me on the shoulder with this panicked look on his face. He goes, Brucey, I just got a call. Two guys are not gonna show up. One guy's late. You're on next. And it was like, Wow, it was like rubbing like a magic lamp and Bud Friedman was the genie and, and I'm going on in front of Johnny Carson. I didn't even have time to get nervous and I just felt that I, I was going to be great because, I, listen, at this point, I, I, even though I was the doorman at the Improv, I had an agent named Irvin Arthur who was – you've heard of him. Yeah, he was absolutely. Absolutely. Had some sure. big stars. He was sending me out to comedy clubs. And you've so honed I've your act now. This is, a, this is a long way from when Mitzi had you go up and you weren't ready. This time you are ready. This time in my mind, I'm totally ready. I got the act. I got an agent. <laughs> Let's go. And Johnny Carson goes on stage. He goes, excuse me, Bud Friedman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's welcome to the stage a young man from my home state of Connecticut who uh, charmed you at the door and stole your hearts and he'll <laughs> steal your hearts with laughter, whatever nonsense he said. And he, they welcome me on stage. And now the audience knows that Carson is in the room and it's a packed crowd and they're going to help Johnny find the next star. And I go up there and I do my first joke and it kills. Oh my God, this is wild. Then I do my second joke. It does better than my first. I do my third joke. It does even better than my second. I'm on what's called a build. I'm on my way. I All I can see is like Burbank. I see the couch. <laughs> I see Ed McMahon. I'm smelling his Budweiser breath. This is the greatest thing. And I go to do my fourth joke. And a voice yells out in the room, you stink. Your jokes are all stolen. And I go, oh, my God, I'm getting heckled. And the room just stops. And I look to see who's heckling me. And it's my agent's son. This guy, Irvin Arthur, had a son named Adam who used to help out at the office. He used to do errands. He must have been like 21 years old. And he's sitting at this table all filled with like empty beer bottles. And he's just looking at me going, you heard me. You stink. And it's just silence. And I go, Adam, I, I, I've lost it at this point. I go, Adam, you can't say those things. We got real big people in the room. He goes, yeah, I know who's in the room. And if you think he's ever going to put you on his show, you're sadly mistaken. And now it's over. When you, Most anyone listening to this podcast, you know when you get nervous, somehow your voice 
even though you're you're perfectly normal, your voice starts to retreat into way back into. So I was like this. I couldn't talk, and and I started to sweat. You know, just like Albert Brooks in uh, yeah. Broadcast News. And I, I mean, if I had a bar of soap, I could have taken a bath. It was just so pathetic. And I, it, what seems to be minutes, but it was really just seconds of me just frozen. And then finally, he just yells out at me, just get off the stage. And it's like the whole room is like, <gasps> like that. And then Bud comes running into the showroom and he takes the microphone out of my hand. And that's it. I just walk off the stage. The room is silent as I'm walking off the stage. And I walk by Johnny Carson and I walk out onto Melrose and then I just keep walking and I walk out the Crescent Heights Boulevard and I'm like, I, I, I couldn't process anything. I, I, I just couldn't. I wanted, you know, the, the, I had like this primal feeling of just wanting to go home and put my head in a pillow, you know, and just like curl up in a ball. And then I realized you can't do that again. This is another Carol O'Connor experience. This is just terrible. And I said, I got to deal with this. I've got to face this. So I, I get to Crescent Heights and I just turn around and I walk back on Melrose to the club. And when I get to the front of the club, the two doormen there have taken Adam Arthur and they've thrown him out of the club. He's visibly drunk and his Jeep was parked like on the sidewalk there. And like like this hurt deer in the headlights that I am, I go up to his to his passenger side window and I go, Adam, why did you do that? And he just like rolls his window down. He, he was wild eyed. And he gives me the finger and he said, you know, F off. And then he puts his Jeep, he had a Jeep Wrangler. He put it into whatever gear. The, the wheels started to spin and he took off and he missed, I swear to you, running over my foot by an, a half an inch. So now I've got this guy who just heckled me almost running over my foot. My world is still like caving in. It's, it, there's no, it hasn't bottomed out yet. And I walk into the improv and Bud Friedman comes running up to me and he goes, Brucey, Brucey, Johnny, Johnny wants to go home now, but he's too drunk to go home. And I've looked around and you're the only responsible person I know here. You're going to have to drive him home. Here's the keys to his car. And he puts the keys to the car in my hand. And I'm like, uh, oh my God, I, I, I can't believe what's going on. And, and, and then I say to myself, you know what? This is my chance. I'll turn it around. I'll be real <laughs> nice to him. I'll make him happy in the car. And maybe I can turn this. I can make a, a lemonade from lemons. Yeah, certainly so, you'd hope that this is like you certainly didn't get you another chance to be exposed to him. I mean, this is pretty cool. I'm not boring you with this story. No, I'm you? simply reminding the audience <laughs> that, uh, that we're I'm just here. having fun with you. <laughs> so, okay. So now... It's 20 minutes later. I'm weird on the time. It could have been an hour later, but I'm just sitting there with his, with his keys. It's well, I'll remind you, Mr. Smirnoff, you're under oath. So you've got to get the time that you're comfortable and with. now he's in the back seat with this blonde girl. Now, remember, he's married at the time. So this is like a terrible, this is a very bad week for him. And, and he's was, drunk, right? Because you told me he already had three shots when oh, he walked in the door. He's a big, he's a big drunk. And there were these four girls that were, they, I remember the comic earlier in the show asking them there where they were from and they were they were only 18 years old and they were in from Chicago and blah 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 so meanwhile the hot blonde is in the back seat with him and I'm on the 405 freeway driving to Bel Air and I got them in the back seat and I I've told Sandy Shire he's uh, <laughs> David Shire's brother and Fred Travelina's musical conductor I had all these witnesses so I could never be sued for these stories he's following me in my car so that I have a ride home once I drop them off at the mansion. And every so often, I'm going, by the way, I'm on the 405, I'm going 41 miles an hour. <laughs> and you know, people are going by me at 80 because I don't want any trouble. I, I am just trying to be nice. And, and I keep looking in the rear view mirror to see the headlights of my car and the girl, they're like making out. And every so often she stops making out with him and she looks and sees my eyes in the rear view mirror and she starts like, Put, punching Johnny in the in the ribs and goes, Johnny, he's funny. You ought to put him on your show. And like, and Carson is so wasted. He leans forward and goes, let me ask you something. What's your name? And he goes, uh, Bruce Smirnoff. Bruce Smirnoff, Mr. Carson. He goes, let me tell you something, Smirnoff. You don't know what you're doing on stage. You got no structure and your jokes stink. And I go, thank you very much. And I go, I just made things worse. I cannot have done anything worse. My playbook is out the window. Everything I dreamt of is now even into more of a, a DEFCOM 1 situation. So 
Now I get to his house. This Josh would have said, but you did see me on stage then, you're saying, right? <laughs> so you remember my oh. name. Tomorrow, you'll remember I was awesome. I was awesome. I was... Anyway, so we get, we get to his house in Bel Air, and he's got like about a 13-foot iron gate with a turret on top. And there's two security guards. One stands at the bottom. He's got like a nine millimeter. And the other guy's got a shotgun at the top turret. This they don't screw around with Johnny Carson. And I pull up with the car and, you know, and they open up the iron gate and I pull in and my car, you know, with Sandy driving it to take me home, it, it pulls in. And I just want this nightmare to try to, I need to stanch the bleeding. So I just want it to be over. So I jump out of the Mercedes and I open up the back door of the passenger uh, side. And I guess he felt he was worried that this girl wanted to go home and didn't want to come into his house with him. So he's got like a full court press. He's like dry humping her in the back seat of the car. And he doesn't see what I see. And what I see is the following. My car pulls in the driveway. And behind my car, another car and another and another. This guy, Sandy, must have told all the bar flies that hang out at the bar at the improv party at Carson's house. So now I've got all these strangers that I barely know, and they're all just jumping out of their vehicles. And they're like, going, hey, party, party at Johnny's house. Meanwhile, his staff of servants, they've all been sleeping. They didn't know he was going to have a party. So now the lights to his mansion come flooding on, and these half-dressed servants come running like the house is on fire. I, he's having a party. Did he call you? He didn't call me. We got to set up. We got to do, we got to have a party. So none of this, he doesn't see any of this. He's on top of this woman, like, like, a, like a professional wrestler putting her into like a, like a, a, a hold. And so everyone is, st is standing at attention. All these revelers are sta sitting on the, you know, like the fenders of their car going, Hey, wait, wait, we're going to have some party now. And then he finally gets off this woman and he gets out of the car and he sees his servants he sees all these guys and he goes, what the hell are these people doing here? I go, Johnny, this is all I know. I told that guy to follow me. He must have told that guy. That guy must have told that. And he goes, you get these people the hell out of here. I'll have you arrested. And I go, Johnny, they're as good as gone. And I made everybody just get in their cars and drive away. And I got in my car and I went home. <laughs> and uh, that was on Saturday night. So on Monday, I called up my agent, Irvin Arthur you know, whose son had done this. And I said, Irvin, your son. And I proceeded to tell him the story. He goes, I kind of heard the story and I'm so sorry. My son's got a very bad drug problem. And we had a fight on Friday and, and to get back at me, he went to the improv to heckle all my clients. And I'm so sorry. And I, it just shames me to even have to apologize to you. And he goes, I assure you, you will never see my son again. And and he was right because the next day Irvin dropped me as a client, and that's it. So it was even worse. The story's so bad on so many levels because every time he had to think of me, he had to think about what a drug addict loser his son was. So he did decided, I'll just think about the son. I won't have it rubbed in by thinking about Bruce. Oh my and God! There's another, another story. I have I have ninety five of these stories. Oh my God! That's just a, horrible. That's a, yeah. Horrible. It's so richly awful. Yeah. Bruce, you also, you, I, I think you met Regis Philbin at the Improv at some point. Didn't Regis come in early on in his career or something? That's right. This one's an amazing one. I've never told this on stage. So it's 1981. And I'm going to say it's like February 1981. I'm 25 years old. Jay, how old are you? 46. You're 46? 46. Okay. So I'm 60. You're 46. So just remember when you were 25, how innocent. I'm an innocent. I grew up in the suburbs of Connecticut. I'm not used to seeing a lot, but obviously my living in Hollywood, I, I wound up seeing everything. But so I'm sitting at a manager's house, Bud Robinson. And his son is Danny Robinson over at APA. Bud was a manager. He handled Doc Severinsen, a lot of big, great, famous comedians and stuff. So I'm at Bud's house. He was a friend of mine. And we're having dinner, just sitting around his dining room table. And Bud Friedman is there. I don't want to get the two Buds mixed up. Bud Robinson, Bud Friedman. And Bud Friedman had uh, married his second wife, Alex, who I'm kind of responsible for them meeting because while Bud was yelling at me, she was standing over my shoulder when I was the doorman and he was so busy yelling at me and she was like flirting over my shoulder and he stopped yelling at me, met her and the rest is history. So they got married anyway. So I, I, I don't mean to digress. So we're sitting at the dining room table, the, the three of us and me and the doorman calls up 
and goes, uh, Regis is coming up. And I go, and Bud goes, oh, okay. And he comes back to the table, goes, Regis is coming up. And I go, who's Reg? And he go, Regis Philbin. And I go, I think I know that name. Wasn't he with Joey Bishop when he had that late night show and he tried to rival the Tonight Show? Yeah, and he did game shows and local news. I go, okay, I've never met him, but I don't know. And so in comes Regis Philbin. Now, in, coincidentally, Bud Robinson, Bud Friedman, and Regis Philbin, they're all the exact same age. They're 51 years old. Now, remember, I'm 25. Now I'm 60. So I'm telling this from so many different perspectives. And in comes Regis Philbin, a man I'd never met, very handsome man. And he sits at the table and it's like a scene almost like out of The Godfather with the Johnny Fontaine. And Regis just goes, you know, I had this audition the other day and it's for this show, a local Los Angeles show. (laughs) I didn't get it. And it just explodes. He starts to cry like I've never seen a grown man cry. Not like, you know, you're seeing a sad movie and tears coming, but when you're shaking, your whole body is shaking. And I could feel, because I was sitting a few feet from him, I could feel the heat coming off of his body and he couldn't control himself. And he, (laughs) like that kind of cry, my life is over. And it was so sad. And again, at 25, I never saw a human being cry like this. You just don't see that. And everyone went over to him and they went, Reege, it's okay. And he goes, no, it's not okay. He would like, Bud, Bud Robinson would put his arm around him. It's not okay. My life is over. It's over. And I remember Bud Friedman going, oh, you know, Reed, you're riding high in April, shot down in May. You never know how things go. <laughs> and it was just that weird moment. Then he finally calmed down. And I don't remember what happened. I think he left. I just can't remember just that moment. And so by, by nailing it to February of 81, you got to remember about Four months later is when he got that morning show with, I, I don't know what it was called. Was it the morning with Kathy Lee Gifford? But at four months later, he was started on the road to insane fame and to never, ever, ever looking back. So I can, I don't know if, I've always wondered if I ever saw him live anywhere and I went up and told him this story. I always wonder how he would react, whether he would deny it. I, I don't know what Regis is like. I, I, I certainly think he's a nice guy. But it, I always said to myself, would, should I confront him with this story if I ever see him? And I said, you know what? He might look at me and go, I don't know what you're talking about. That never happened. And then I look like an idiot. Or if I tell him that story and he goes, you know, that really did happen. And I don't know why you brought that up. That was a very bad time in my life. Why don't you go jump off a cliff? So I always. But rem- I can't see him or being he might say that was a beautiful him, no moment. And yes, that was the nadir of my life. And I thought my life was over. And then look what happened. I'm worth, you know, $90 million all these years later. So I think it's a beautiful story. I just always debate whether what would happen if I ever told him uh, the story or not, you know. You mentioned your one-man show. There was a moment. Your one-man show was red hot, and this guy comes pushing through the crowd. (laughs) Oh, God, stop. So my show is because of Jeff Ross. He's so nice to me in my career. He was blabbing to the guy at the L.A. Times and said, if you want to see something, go see Bruce Runoff's show. The guy from the L.A. Times came and they put me on the front page of the Thursday calendar, which other than the Sunday Mm -hmm. calendar is a huge, a huge thing, huge honor. So at this point now, everyone's coming to my show. And it was so exciting. I had agents. You know, I had all these big time people that I couldn't get on the phone. They were coming and it was a very exciting time of my life. and, And it felt great. And. This one particular time, Danny Robinson, I just mentioned his father from APA, he was coming. This manager was coming. And so I do the show, standing ovation. It couldn't have been any perfect. And Danny is uh, talking to me after the show, and I've got all these people around me, and the manager, is he's, he's trying to talk to me. And through it all is this short man. He's got to be about 65 years old, this, this real Jewishy looking guy wearing a suit and tie. Nobody wears a suit and tie on a Wednesday in Los Angeles, right? And he just pushes Danny Robinson out of the way. He pushes the manager out of the way and he comes up and he goes, I'm Cy Sussman. He goes, this is a fantastic show. I discovered the Bronx tale with a Chaz Palm and Terry. This is along the lines of a Bronx tale. Who represents you? And I went, I I, I go, I I don't have representation because I'm with William Morris and I told you, I brought them everything. This is great. I want to bring it to Jeff Witches tomorrow morning. Uh, Do I have your permission? And not only did I say yes, but if he had also said, I also want a lobster, I would have just run, put him in my car and taken him to the palm and bought him a lobster because this guy just had the authority. He goes, I said, go home. They'll be calling you in the morning. So it's, it's amazing. 
I, I, I again, and I couldn't sleep. And I, I wake up like at, at, at nine o'clock and I want to call Jeff, which is his office. He's, you know, total TV packager at William Morris, like this size size Sussman told me to do. And, uh, I wait till 1030 because I just just give a half an hour, let them have their coffee, whatever. They go, William Morris. I go, hi, it's Bruce Smirnoff for Jeff Witches. They go, one moment, please. And there's a beat. And it goes, hi, Bruce, it's Jeff. I go, hey, Jeff, uh, I'm just following up. Uh, Cy Sussman saw my show last night. He told me I should call you and tell you to handle me uh, personal appearances, uh, package me, television, writing, the whole the whole schmear. And he goes, um, not a problem, Bruce. I've got someone assigned to come check out your show, but I have to tell you something. I go, what's that, Jeff? He goes, a Cy Sussman is our projectionist. And without missing a beat, I go, absolutely. He projects <laughs> all the projects that are coming to William Morris. He told me about that yesterday. He goes, no, no, no. Cy Sussman runs the movie projector in the screening room. And I, I got to tell you, it was even worse than the Carol O'Connor. It was what I, I couldn't believe how I had been had. This guy just uses the fact that he's Cy Sussman from William Morris. Technically, he is. He runs the freaking movie. He turns the button. He presses the button to make the kids so they can watch movies. And, and, and that's how he gets his free tickets. And I, oh, God. And oh, of that's course, great. William Morris never came to the show and whatever. That is just great. Oh my I God. love that I, story. Uh, uh. I wanted to kill that guy. And then I used to run into him. He, he glommed onto Jackie Mason years later. And, you know, he was just a sycophant hanging around Jackie uh, Mason and stuff. Yeah, yeah unbelievable. Just, if people want to keep up with you, like, do you still do any touring or anything or not so much? Well, I tour on cruise ships, so that's impossible. You have to have just happen to happenstance be on a ship. And these condominiums here in South Florida are private. So, so I'll be at the Borgata Hotel in Atlantic City. That one man show I did, it's called Other Than My Health, I Have Nothing. And today I don't feel so good. You can actually watch it for free on YouTube. And you just put in Bruce Smirnoff one man show. And it will, you'll see all, uh, you'll see what you, you saw, Mark. It's great. And I, I, I and really I, can't recommend it enough. And I give my enough. email if anyone, yeah, you can please, Facebook me. Yep. And if you want to email me, it's BruceVodka at Yahoo.com. <laughs> say hi, you can say hi to me. Really, really a kick to talk to you. I'm always rooting for a comic like you. You're funny, talented, nice guy. And, you know, ultimately you didn't get KO'd by any of this stuff. So uh, very happy. KO'd. I have a wonderful, I'm so blessed. I have great friends. Thank God I have great health. I have my family. Everything is cool. So, yes, it all it all uh, comes. You just can't have everything in life, you know? Yeah. Thanks, Bruce Smirnoff. Appreciate it. Great visit, man. Thank you man. very much, Thank all you. you guys. Heather, Mark, and, and Josh. Thank you. It was great being with you. Okay. Thank you. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I, I think when you're that close to the apex of things and you crash, it makes for a great story. Plus, I would say you should see his one-man show on YouTube. It is funny. I Did remember you? when it was happening back then. Yeah. Uh, he was deep in the comedy community, and... Then he had all this stuff happen and at the same time, and he was able to somehow package it into like an entertaining show. It's unreal. We've all been close to the magic, but you know. No, for sure. Uh, I remember, you know, my very first job, I was, they fired the lead. And so we pre taped all the scenes we could without it was a sitcom for yeah. camera. And I was, as we're pre taping scenes that the lead is not in, they're upstairs casting for the lead. It was crazy. Wow, that's The wild. number one on the call sheet, or number two on the call sheet, lead man. Number one was the woman. I remember getting a call from the Fox Network saying, get down here to Sunset Gower because we're doing a show with Dick Clark and he's faltering. He's, oh he was hosting the show and he's struggling. Like you can see that he's just having a rough time. He's just at that point older or just having a bad week or whatever. And they said, can you get down here in like the next half hour? I said, sure, you know. And I get down there and they go, listen, just stand here. If Dick Clark has any more problems, we're going to just put you in. We're going to reshoot the whole damn thing with you hosting it. You're the under dick. Right. <laughs> Which is a weird feeling. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because you're rooting for someone to falter. Right. you know, will be fine. I mean, actually, you know, it's Dick Clark. <laughs> yeah. There's not that much shot in front of really. Yeah. You know? When he had the stroke, I always wondered, was that like a delayed wish that <laughs> was paid off? bad vibes. <laughs> Stop finally it. No, I would, never, through I, would, heart. I would never wish a stroke on anybody. You guys, I do have to go. I love you very much. Okay. I'm on a very tight schedule today. Right. I am too. I'm, I, I don't have to leave right now. <laughs> But um, I am you don't have to leave busy. until very like 10 o'clock tonight. Very busy. Got to go. Gotta go. <laughs> I busy. do. I do. That was crazy. Uh, you, uh, Heather is at Heather Ankeny. Josh is at 
J. Elvis Weinstein. He's also and got check his... out Thought Spiral. I was just about to fucking get to it if you just give me a motherfucking second. Wow. And he's got his own podcast, which is what I was going to say with Andy Kindler. It's called Thought Spiral. Okay, Josh? Yeah, I wasn't thinking. I was trying to help you out. I wasn't trying to usurp your plugging power. <laughs> Are you on iTunes and Stitcher yeah, and all, all of the things. ways He's you can a big hit. listen to all a podcast? He really is a big hit. <laughs> we, we love having you here with us, Josh. Thanks, man. <laughs> and Heather. And everybody. Bye. Bye. Edge-show.com. Edge-show.com. The hyphen is stupid. Edge-show.com. Hey, everybody. Why don't you do me a favor and like the ads with Mark Thompson on Facebook. Yeah, that's going to bring in the kids.